Good morning. Great to have you on this beautiful, uh, beautiful weekend as we're traveling through uh, the fruit of the Spirit. I was reminded as we were singing in the first service this morning uh, that we have this theology of worship. And basically to worship God, a number of things have to converge. Uh, number one, you would want to have a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And so you would say, well, my life isn't all that pleasing to the Lord in different spots. And so you would have a time with the Lord where you're saying, Lord, thank you for your goodness and kindness in my life. And please forgive me for these things. And then you would gather corporately with a group of people like we're doing here this morning. And we would sing, uh, sing songs to God, glorifying God, about God, exalting God. And then the third aspect of worship is where we then quiet our hearts and we hear from God. And so we always want to have all three of those elements. And today we look at the twin fruit of God's kindness and his goodness. I've had the advantage of studying this out and meditating on it and thinking about it this whole week, uh, trying to put it in practice, try to be intentional. And I have to tell you, it's really been a great week in that regard when you can think about intentionally being kind. Just something as simple as I was in the Casey's line and a guy was in front of me and, and I was just, uh, just going to just pay for a donut, just a single donut person in front of me. Their card wasn't working and this wasn't working and uh, do you have rewards with us? And it was kind of taking us a while to get through whatever they were. The, the lady behind me, she had things in both hands. And I was thinking about, well, just the kindness. And so when it was finally time for that person to go, and I told the lady, hey, why don't you go ahead of me? And she looked at me like, are you crazy or something? Nobody says that. And no, just go on ahead of me, you know. And, and so she said uh, thank you to me. And then the lady that took my money said thank you to me. And I was like, wow, this kindness thing does kind of go a ways. Maybe we should try it more often. Uh, be kind has become the unofficial unofficial cultural slogan, especially since COVID. Uh, you find it on t-shirts and uh, bumper stickers, and maybe you have Be Kind. Uh, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. That's kind of a slogan, uh, be kind. Uh, but for all the talk about kindness, our world is growing increasingly unkind, divided, contemptuous. The question could be asked, if kindness is so popular, why is our culture so harsh? Isn't it? And tragically, and this is where God loops us in here, tragically, the very people who know Christ as Lord and Savior, who are to make Christ known uh, uh, by loving one another and in our community, can be harsh talking about us, myself, quarrelsome, impatient, shrill, and downright nasty. Uh, we're coming into the political season. I didn't hear anybody say amen to that. In public and political discourse, believers amongst us, there are fits of anger. It's easy to slander somebody we've never met ourselves. Uh, we take our version of the news, wherever we're getting it from, as gospel. And whatever they say about a particular person, well, that's got to be the truth, right? That's the way it is. And we're, we're filled with ourselves with divisions and even a general spirit of discourtesy amongst the brothers in Christ. It's only human to respond in kind, uh, but today we're going to find, no, it's only Christ-like to respond in kindness, in kindness, the exact opposite of responding in kind. So let me give you two short definitions of kindness and goodness. You're going to see that they're almost similar. We could almost use the same definition for both. Kindness is serving others generously in act and thought act and thought, and then goodness, very similar, acting out a selfless desire to serve others. 
Now, in Bible college, I learned this, and Pastor Trevor is teaching a class during the first service on how to study the Bible. I remember the professor saying, whenever you find a list in Scripture, and there's a, a number of lists in the New Testament, whenever you find a list, and there's two words that seem like they're exact same, in our case, kindness and goodness, really work hard to find the nuance of difference. So although these words are used interchangeably in Scripture, let me just give you this little bit of nuance of difference when you're thinking about these two words. Kindness then tends to be more the disposition of the heart. Uh, so a kind person it has this disposition of their heart. And goodness, uh, the, the difference in goodness would be it's an expression of the hands. So, so if you were going to divide the two, kindness and goodness, it's a disposition of the heart, and goodness then would be an expression, it would be the outworking of, of, that, of that heart. They're used interchangeably. The word goodness actually is the Greek word, it's, we get our English word philanthropic from that. Philanthropy comes from uh, the Greek word for goodness. So I have four points I'd like to make about kindness and goodness, and I'd like to, to give them to you. It, this is more of a topical study, so this will be a little bit of a paper chase if you have your Bible, you like turning. Now, you could certainly, you should certainly write down each of the verses I give you under each of these four points, and if you want to uh, keep up in your Bible, you could do that. Each verse that I reference, the majority of them will be up uh, on the screen this morning. So four points I'd like to make when it uh, is concerning kindness and goodness as a fruit uh, of the Spirit. Kindness and goodness. Number one, kindness and goodness are rooted in the heart of God's character. This is who God is. This is who God tells us he is. He's kind and he's good. His disposition of heart and the expression of his hands are kind and good. If there was anything I could personally say amen to this morning, it would be that kindness and goodness are the expression of God's heart. Amen. Have you experienced the kindness and goodness of God? Well, it's rooted in the very character of God. Let me give you a couple passages of scripture of this morning, a couple Old Testament and a couple new. Psalm 145 and verse 17. And since it's up on the screen, why, why don't you all read it with me? The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, and he's kind in all of his works. Some versions for the word righteous, the interchangeable word would be the word good. The Lord is good in all of his ways, and he's kind in all of his works. Uh, Hosea chapter 11, I've got this on two screens, so it's Hosea 11, verses 1 through 4. You'd have a hard time uh, finding that in, in your Bible. You might have to go to the, the index there, but let me read it for you. Now, this is God speaking about the nation of Israel whom he loved, but they always disobeyed him. And just think about this in a parenting kind of relationship or your relationship with God. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called the more they went away. Uh, they kept sacrificing to the Baals and burnt offerings uh, to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. So he's, he's thinking of this imagery of bringing them up, being their father. I, I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. They didn't give me any credit for a good thing that happened in their life. I led them with cords of kindness in other words, he's binding himself to these rebellious people with kindness, with bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaw. I made their life uh, comfortable. And I bent down, this is God, uh, to them, and I fed them. And so I just want you to notice in the character of God when we talk about kindness and goodness, notice who it's directed towards. Not to people who are responding in kind, because they're not. They're going to be the exact opposite. He's responding in kindness to this waywardness of his children. Look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. So he's just going to cut, cut right to the chase. Not, this isn't love in kind or, or to responding in kind, but love your enemies. Okay, so this is, this is an imperative for us. And do good 
and lend, uh, give generously out of your own reserves and, your, and, and the blessings that you had, give, expecting nothing in return. That's not responding in kind, that's responding in kindness. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is, now notice this, well I actually have it underlined so say it with me, he's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So if this is gonna be a fruit of the Spirit, it's gonna be a quality of God that the Spirit takes that he wants to see come out through our lives. So, so far it's the wayward, the lost, the ungrateful and the evil. The person that can't pay us back, the poor and the needy. There's going to be no, uh, there's going to be no expectation of return on investment other than the Lord's going to be pleased and that person or family or whoever is going to be blessed. Let's just take it a step farther. And I, I, I quote this verse all the time because this is, this is one of those verses, truths of Scripture where God cut me to the core and actually brought me to himself. Paul said, do you presume on the riches of his kindness? You, 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 do you not even think about his kindness in your life and common grace and the ways that he's blessed you and, and forbearance and patience? Did you not know that his kindness, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So notice this people, they are not repentant yet. He's being kind to these wayward people, you and me. And the purpose for his kindness is to bring us to our senses and bring us to himself, to repent. God's kindness. God never asks us to do or be something that he's not. That's what we need uh, to see uh, right here. Uh, point number two, kindness and goodness are displayed in the person of God's son. Kindness and goodness are displayed in the person of God's son. Think of God's, if you know Christ, think of, think of God's kindness to you in the person of Christ could go to many verses. I'll refer to a number of them, but I'll just show you this one. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, Jesus says, upon you, and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And notice I have an, a word underlined here, because it's the same word that's used it's the word kind, but here it's translated easy. For my yoke is easy, my yoke is kind, and my burden is light. So, so God's saying no, Jesus saying no, come to me. And you're gonna think, well, if I come to you, I gotta give up so many things in my life and I'll never have fun again and I won't be able to you know, do it. No, he's saying no, you, you're thinking wrong. Like, come to me. And learn from me. You're going to find that I'm gentle and lowly, and I will actually create a desire in you to want the things that I want you to want. And my yoke is very kind. It's very gracious. It's it's very soft and tender. The world is most unkind in its unkindness to God. Can I get an amen there? The world hates God. They're, they might not come out and say it, and they might even go to a church. But, but ultimately, they don't like the authority of God, and, and the history of mankind has been a hatred for the real one true God and his son, the Lord Jesus. But how does he respond? He responds back in kindness. Think with me about the kindness of God. Think about your own life. And if, like, if I said, hey, at the end of the service, I want you to give me a top 10 ways that Christ has been kind to you. But, but let me just list a couple of them. He's, he's patient with his disciples when you go through the Gospels. Shouldn't we say amen to that? Like, thank you, Lord. He heals without judgment. He, he doesn't say when he heals somebody, how'd you get yourself into this? I want you to think about it. Go stand in the corner for a little bit and when you have the right attitude, you come and I'll heal you. No. He welcomes children into his arms. The, the adults in the room are saying, he's too busy, he's too important. He's like, no, you stop that and stop hindering the kids from coming to me. He's kind. He touched the leper to heal him. Nobody would touch a leper. Most likely you wouldn't touch a leper. He touched the leper. He spoke gently to the woman at the well, even though he knew her whole history, all of the garbage, the five men and the guy she was with right now that wasn't her man, it wasn't her husband. He spoke gently to her. 
When, when you think about the woman caught in adultery and how they bring him out, I'm, I'm assuming if they caught her in adultery, they were trying to humiliate her and everybody else. And so they didn't, they didn't help her put garments on to bring him Jesus. If you read the context, he wouldn't even look. He, he, would, he just looked down. He wouldn't look. He, out of respect for her, and he treated her with dignity and kindness. The, 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 the person that was going to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter whacks off his ear, and he, he reaches down, he puts the ear, and it just uh, suddenly healed. That guy's got to be in heaven, doesn't he? Doesn't he have to say, I'm switching sides? I mean, I'd like to think that I was like, hey, he's God, and he put that ear back on there. I hope I can talk to him in heaven. He forgives those who mocked him at the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wept over the city of Jerusalem at the beginning of that last week because they didn't know what was coming their direction for rejecting him. But his greatest display was on the cross. So let me just read the verses again that Phil read for us this morning. For we, now think about the kindness of Christ. For we ourselves were once foolish. We were disobedient. We were led astray. We were slaves to various passions and pleasures. Come on, think about it. Passing our days in malice and envy. Hated by others and hating one another. What a harsh world. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Now get the, get the good works on the right side of the equation. Not by works done by us in righteousness. You don't clean up. You don't put a suit coat on. You don't walk an aisle. You don't get baptized. You don't go to communion. You don't become a church member of Lakeside to make yourself right with God. You don't, you don't beautify. No, he takes you in this state and then he creates good works out of you. Get him on the right side of the equation. But according to his mercy, not your goodness, by the washing of regeneration. That's the Holy Spirit's work. That's not water. And by the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, why did he do that? So that by being justified by his grace, we're made right with God because of his unmerited favor. We might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And just notice how the passage finishes. Paul said the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, which I'm right now the vocal person insisting on these things for myself and us, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Good works. You don't come to Christ because of your good works, but once you come to Christ, your life should be filled with good works. You see how that works? We should devote ourselves to good works, kindness and goodness. These things are excellent and profitable for people, not only for the recipients of the kindness and goodness, but Scripture says you yourself will be blessed in God's name God's name will be honored. So behold is kindness and goodness. Now I want to say something right here as just an aside. I don't want you to miss the picture of the beautiful Savior. But I would be remiss in any conversation about kindness if I didn't say this. At times, Jesus said some very difficult and hard things. So listen, hear me out. Kindness is not niceness. Nice, the word nice is never found in the Bible. Now, there's a softness to kindness, but a nice person doesn't have any convictions about anything. They'll stand for anything, and they'll fall for everything. So, so there's no convictions to their kindness. The, nice, they, they don't want to say a hard thing about anything. They don't, they're not going to speak the truth in love. And so now you have churches that are really nice because they stand for nothing, and they fall for everything. There are times when we're called, because of kindness, to speak the truth in love. Christ himself was our, was our example for this. And so our culture is kind of swayed by this idea of niceness. Don't have any absolute truth in your life except for the truth that there can be no absolutes. That's the one thing that they stand for. And so then they stand for nothing. And so then you have tolerance, and you have affirmation, and you have acceptance of things that Christ calls sin. So kindness is not speaking the truth in love. 
but it takes the edge off of the, the words that would be spoken, and sometimes a tough word has to be said. I was thinking of this this morning, so I don't have it up here, but just listen to Psalm 1, uh, 141 in verse 5. Let me find it. Psalm 141 in verse 5. So, so this, this kind of puts an umbrella on this idea of kindness. Let a right, so this is what the psalmist said, David said, let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it will be oil, uh, it'll be oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. So, so a church that's nice is not going to stand for anything. A church that's kind is going to be reaching out with the gospel and talking to people and not leading with how much they are sinner are. We're going to treat them like the woman at the well. But eventually we're going to talk about he's a holy God, we're sinners. And if you don't, uh, if you don't come to grips with that, you're going to be lost for eternity. So kindness is not niceness, but there should be a softness to our kindness. Truth number three or point number three. We've been saying this all along in this series. Kindness and goodness is produced by the indwelling of God's spirit. The kind of kindness, God's kindness, biblical kindness, is going to be very difficult to, to just get in a corner and have a rah-rah talk and, and go out and be consistent with it. It's got to come from the heart, and it's produced by the indwelling of God's Spirit. Now, I'm just going to take us to, to, to one set of verses here. So if you have your Bible, you could turn there. Uh, I'll turn myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It'll also be up here on the screen. But I, but I, want, to, I want to read this to you so, so we can just for a moment talk about the power of the indwelling Spirit of God. So biblically, again, so we make sure that everybody understands this. The moment you trust Christ as Lord and Savior, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says, the Spirit of God comes to, Spirit of Christ comes to take up residence in you. So when God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that means that you have the indwelling, permanent indwelling, sealed by the Spirit of God. He's never going to leave you. So he's always trying to produce these Christ-like qualities out of our life. He's never going to stop doing that. He's never going to go away. He doesn't take a vacation. And so he's going to gently prod and he's going to at, at times speak to you in your conscience and in your life and through the scripture about what kind of person you should be. And we should be thankful for that. But look at 1 Corinthians 6. I'll just read verses 9 through 11 and then we'll jump down to verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Is that unkind of God to say that? No. No, he's being kind. He's, he's telling it like it is. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And you say the first part of verse 11 with me. And such were some of you. No, you point at me and I'll point at you. And such were some of you. That's us. But you were washed, not with water, but by the Spirit of God and the cleansing agent of the blood of Christ. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And then here's where I was aiming for, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So, so this, is, this is the temple. This is where Christ is. When, when, when the believers leave this room, this is no longer... This isn't church. Church is people. This, this isn't, we're going to go to church. That's not, that's not proper biblical grammar. We are the church if you're a follower of Christ. We're, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in us, whom you have from God. Now notice, so on the fruit of the Spirit, this isn't, well, I think, you know, I think I got that nailed. No, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Let's time out. What was the price? Come on, let's think about it. What was the price that we were bought with? It was the blood of Christ. Uh, by the way, newsflash, kind of a big deal to God the Father. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. Bought with a price. So do what, according to this verse? Glorify God in your body. So you're... Kindness of disposition should lead to an expression of good deeds from your hand. It's straight from God himself. Yeah, praise the Lord for that's God. 
So God's kindness to us is used by the Holy Spirit to produce kindness from us. We should be changed. We should go about life different. We should love truth. We should hate untruth. We should hate false truth. We, we, we should love people. We, we, we should love what sin does to people. We, we, should, we should build bridges into people's lives. We should be kind and good. We should have a hundred good deeds come, come out before we even speak the truth in love. But eventually we're aiming to speak the truth in love. Amen? Amen. Even Jesus said you'll always have the poor with you. That doesn't mean don't give to the poor and don't be generous. We should. On the merit of just being kind to the poor. But as an expression, we should always be ready to give an answer. It's because of Christ. We're like, I wouldn't be this kind to you if it wasn't for what, the kindness of Christ in my own life. So point number four of four points. Kindness and goodness is adorned by good deeds of God's people. So, so we want to we want to put a practical expression to the kindness of God that the Holy Spirit is filtering through our life and it comes out into good deeds. Now remember, it's not good deeds to be right with God. It's good deeds that flow out of being right with God. Don't, don't misunderstand that. So where do we get this idea of adorning? Well, Titus 2, uh, so a chapter before what Phil read and, and uh, what I read just a little bit ago. So let's just take a look at this. Not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything uh, they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So this is why I'm starting today with uh, kindness and goodness is rooted in the heart of God's character and then it's displayed in the person of God's Son. That's the doctrine. That's the truth. And so then how do we adorn the kindness and goodness of God the Father and God the Son? What does it look like to put that kindness and that goodness on like a, like a coat? Like everywhere I go, this is, this is what surrounds me. That, that's what it means to adorn the doctrine of God. It, it means to, this is what I want them to see. The actual word adorn is where we get our word ladies cosmetics from. It's it, It's the actual word for that. It means to arrange, to be intentional, to put together. To, to have a desire to present oneself. That's what the word means. And so if we're going to adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in kindness and goodness, we have, to be, we have to be intentional about this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, there's kindness versus niceness, and worldly passion, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. Now notice why. Again, this is a theme that's over and over and over waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He's coming back, amen. amen. Who gave himself for us. Well, there could be a 10, 20, 50 reasons. Here's one. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, purify for himself a people for his own possession who are, say the underlying words, zealous for good works, intentional, excited, can't wait to do it. Like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to put it in my life. Like, I, I'm not just going to talk about kindness and goodness. Oh, what did Pastor Dave preach on today? Oh, kindness and goodness. You know, everybody gets that. You know, got, got, that, got that plaque up in the house. No, like zealous for this with a purpose. Two more scriptures. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's just going to keep getting gooder and gooder. I know that's bad English. That was intentional. Don't write me an email. Better and better. Gooder and gooder. His kindness is not going to stop towards us. Can we give the Lord a hand? I mean, that is... I mean, the older I get, the more I'm thankful for his kindness. I look back at my life, I was like, man, that was kindness and goodness. That was undeserved. Holy smokes, thank you, Lord. For by grace you've been saved. My, these are two of my saving passages, Scripture. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. Notice again, not a result of works. It's not works that make you right with God. 
but notice the proper place of work so that no one may boast. You're not going to get to heaven. God's going to say, why did, Dave, why should I let you into heaven? Well, you know, I went to Bible college and I didn't murder anybody and I was a pastor of a church for, for as long as I could handle it. And, you know, and all these kind of things is like, well, why did Christ die on the cross? No, it's not by works. Nobody's going to boast when they get to heaven. Matter of fact, when you read scripture and somebody stands before Christ for the very first time, there ain't a whole lot of words left. They fall down and they worship him. So it's not a result of works that no one, for, but notice verse 10, for our purposes. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what? It's underlined. For good works, which God prepared beforehand. Every one of our lives, God has laid out a path using our past experiences, our personality, and the giftedness that he's given once we're saved. And he's created a path for us to walk. The path is laden with good works uh, that we should walk in them so that we can be a living testimony of the kindness and goodness of God our Savior. Amen? Amen. How is the world going to know? It's not kind for me to lead with words telling him you're a sinner and you're going to go to, it, it's not. Eventually I'm getting there, but I got to lead with kindness and goodness. I got to talk. Did you not know that God's kindness in your life is meant to bring you to the feet of Christ? It's these works. Just one more. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another in God as God in Christ has forgave you. Just, just stop for a moment, let that soak in. You are to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, just like Christ was to you. Go back to the day when you can most remember the kindness and goodness of God to you. Remember the beauty of realizing you did not deserve his kindness and goodness. And then get that as your frame of mind and extend it out as a witness for Christ. It's not a respond in kind. It's a respond in kindness. So let me just practically lay out a couple of things. We should curb our impulse to speak sharply. We're coming into the political season. This is very appropriate for all of us. We should refrain from gossip. Gossip is both speaking and about a person to another person. And gossip also is listening to a person speak about another person. You can be guilty of gossip on both ends, by speaking and by listening. We should refrain from slander of people we've never met. We should give to the needy out of the substantial part of which God has blessed us, not the crumbs. We should forgive one another with no strings attached. We should be gentle in our private thoughts. Here's how this worked with me this week. So when I'm going to think a thought about a person or a situation, and it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a kind, it's not a gentle thought, the Spirit of God brings to your mind, Dave, you shouldn't think that. Lord, please forgive me for thinking that. So be gentle in your private thoughts. So the kindness of God is not just an external change of manners, it's an internal change of heart. It requires being intentional. Last week we said joy is most evident when things are difficult in your life. Then somebody can tell joy. Well, kindness and goodness are most evident when you're extending it to the person that least deserves it from your perspective. So in Scripture, it would go toward the lost, the enemy, the poor, the widow, the father, fatherless, the broken, the marginalized. Uh, for today's purpose, I'll say it would go to the person from the other political party, whatever that is. So I just close with this. I want to use an object lesson right in front of us, the political season that we're coming in. What if in this coming political season, we reduce the political rhetoric and we take what God has to say seriously? I'm not saying no civil discourse. I'm not saying that it would be easy. I'm saying it's going to be very hard to thread the needle of knowing when to say something and when not to. But what if we just took God at his word? Let me give you two portions of scripture that should guide a believer in kindness and goodness in this coming political season. The Lord's servants, 2 Timothy 2, uh, must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring, 
uh, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance. The kindness of God is meant to lead them to repentance. Actually, you disagree with somebody and you're so kind in your disagreement. Clearly, the disagreement is, is, is verbalized, but you're so kind in that they're, they're, they're like taken back because that'll amaze people today. You get an opportunity to tell them about how God's changed your life, leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses, escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So, so a change in the political rhetoric. Now, l- let me just say this, and my time's up. We are citizens of heaven, amen? We are, 2 Corinthians 5, ambassadors for Christ, amen? We're not ambassadors primarily for the Republican Party or, to be fair, for the Democrat Party. We're not called to be an ambassador. We're called to speak the truth in love, And it's very hard to thread the needle. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, But we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. And it's going to be most visible in the season that's coming ahead of us. Here's the final word on the subject. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. That's kindness, not niceness. So justice is, there is a right and a wrong. And we acknowledge that. We don't run from that. And to say the words with me that are underlined right here. To love kindness. Like to have it on our mind. To desire it through our life. And to walk humbly with your God. We can make a difference. There's a lost world all around us. In our neighborhoods. In our families. At the school. In the culture. We're called to be a light in a dark world. Let's start with kindness and goodness, amen? Let's do it. Let's do it by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit of God. Father, thanks. I'm so thankful uh, to, Lord, I've known you for 41 years. I've been a pastor just short of 25 years in studying kindness and goodness and thinking about being intentional Lord, I'm not sure why I haven't been more intentional all these years. Uh, this, is, this is an avenue. This is a bridge to your kindness and goodness. This is an opportunity to speak on your behalf. This is an opportunity to adorn your character. This is an opportunity to be different in a culture that has gone mad. Uh, Lord, help us to rise to the occasion Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know your son as Lord and Savior, then I pray that in the quietness of right where they're sitting between you and them, Lord, that they would admit that they don't have this fruit of the Spirit. It's not evident in their life. It hasn't sprung from the deepest part of their hearts. They, they know that they're sinners in need of a Savior. They, they, they want your gentleness and your lowliness. And so, Lord, I just pray that they would cry out and they would, they would, your word, Lord, that they would be saved, they'd be forgiven, they'd be granted eternal life. They would believe in your son's finished work on the cross and receive it into their lives, this very moment. And then, Lord, for us that know you, oh, Lord, would you, would you help us to reflect this week, Father, on your kindness and goodness and your son's kindness and goodness and what your spirit the kindness and goodness that he wants to work out of us, to squeeze out of us, to produce out of us. Lord, would we be, would we be willing patience on the operating table, not flopping around so much, but be willing to do what you would want us to do. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's precious name. Amen.